Today we have a special guest speaker uh, we, that we've invited to, to share the word this morning. An alumni of Elam Tabernacle, all the way back from the 80s. Uh, pastor, a retired pastor, but a pastor of Victory Church in Lethbridge, Alberta. Many of you know Victory Church well over the years. Um, he's an AOG uh, pastor as well. Uh, works here as a, a financial advisor for cooperators. Just a, a real delight to get to know uh, Kirby Lockhart this past uh, couple of, well, I guess since the summer. We, we met and we talked a few times. And just a, a, a great man. Just excited to have him come in and get the chance to share in his his home church where he got saved. He even showed me the spot. And that, that touched me. That, that meant a lot. And so I want to give a great Alexis Park Church welcome to, to Pastor Kirby Lockhart. Thank you. Thanks, Sean. Thank you. I appreciate the invite. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's great to see you all here. And it's great to be in the service here today. Yes, interspersed in my, today's message, I'll tell a little bit of my story that uh, dates back uh, 40 years, which is a huge number for some of you in this room. For others, it's not such a big number, whatever it is to you. So uh, it's just a real thrill for me to be here today. I've also invited a lot of friends and family, so thank you for showing up. And there are people here that can attest to the story I'm going to tell you, because some of it's a little bit ludicrous, some of it's uh, close to borderline insane, and you'll go, that didn't really happen. But it actually did happen to me here, and there are people in the service that were there or that can attest. So just so you know, you know, this is not fake news. This is <laughs> Kirby's, since some of you don't know who I am, none of what I'm talking about here is, is fake news. Thanks, Pastor, for the invite, and thank you for showing up. You had to get up this morning, you had to clean up, you had to show up, so thanks for that. If you can put the verse up on the screen, I'm going to talk for a few minutes about Never Have I Ever, and is a message I've entitled, it's, a, it's not based on the TV show on Netflix, which is about a complicated teenager's life, an Indo-American, the show may be funny, but I'm actually just using the title about Never Have I Ever, and if, uh, if you're new to church or whatever, you can, you can say... Uh, Things like, preach it, white man, uh, go, Kirby, go, amen. You can say those things if you want, because all of us respond well generally to affirmation, so you can feel free to say such things. Um, here's the verse I'm going to talk about in a few minutes. I'm, this is uh, Psalm 37. It's a cool psalm. We're only going to look at one verse. It's a cool psalm for this reason. It's 40 verses long. We're going to focus on verse 25. What's really amazing, psalms were written originally in Hebrew, is that this is called an alphabetical psalm. And what that means is every verse in the 40 verses starts with the next letter of the Hebrew alphabet. So imagine if you were going to write a song, you were going to write something yourself, and you decided that it was going to have a verse, and it was going to have to have 26 verses, and everyone had to start with the letter A, then B, then C. Think how hard that would be. That's what this psalm is. It blows your mind. So this is verse 25. This is King David when he's older, and he says, I have been young, and now I'm old. Yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his descendants begging bread. There's just four points in here I'm going to delve with, and then I'll get out of your way. One of the things you see is he says, I was young once. And I want you to know I was young once and used to attend this church when I was young. I used to sit over here in the youth section. Then he says, and now I'm old. What I like about this is that we're from the West. We eschew aging. So no one in this room is old. There's just some of you, like me, who are no longer young. <laughs> Can we go with that today? Allow me, right? Allow me the privilege that we are going to talk for a few minutes about being young. And then we're going to talk for a few minutes about not being young anymore. Okay? And I am in that category, which is why I'm speaking here today, again, amidst friends. Well, you should have white Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Indeed. Then he says, and here's the part we're going to focus on. He says, I have not seen. Now, what the verse does not say, but it is implied, so I'm going to talk about this as well. When you're young or when you're old, you've seen a lot of things. This is near the end of David's life, and he says... I have not seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. But what is inferred in the verse is, I've seen a lot. So we're going to talk about being young. We're going to talk about being old. We're going to talk about seeing things in our life. And we're going to talk about things we've never seen. 
do those four things, then I'll get out of your way, and everyone can go have a good time. So let's start with this first one here. David said, I was young, right? I was young. The famous story that, for those of you that are a little unfamiliar with the Bible today, the famous story, of course, is when David slays Goliath in 1 Samuel 17. What people forget is that he was a teenager. And the Philistines were fighting his people, and the army was, the, the battle was at a detente, an impasse, almost like what's happening with Russia and Ukraine. It was just stuck. And David, a teenager, rushed to the front with a slingshot, and there the Philistine giant was named Goliath. Some of you know this because you went to Sunday school. And Goliath was like today's Shaquille O'Neal. You know, he's just a big, big dude, huge man when you read the measurements. He's just a monstrous guy. And David, with a slingshot, throws the sling, buries the stone in Goliath's head. Goliath falls down dead. David takes out Goliath's sword, cuts his head off. This is all in the Bible. It's great for Sunday school, right? Four-year-olds, they hear that and they come home. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's great. Thanks. Can't sleep, Mom. So, <laughs> slays Goliath. And it begins a, ter- a complete metamorphosis of David's life, Israel. David becomes its first king. It just goes on. So when he was young, he had seen this. He had experienced this. So when you're young, you see things. And he had seen this amazingly, where he had killed Goliath before, he was out of, before David was out of high school in our vernacular. I first attended this church. I was in grade 11. It was 1980. I was 17 years old. And through meeting who would become my wife, Heidi, who's here. We've been married 39 years. We worked together at the Village Green Inn, and Heidi invited me to this church, and it was here that I gave my life to Christ at at 17 years old. This place means a lot to me for that reason alone. And there are people that are here today that were there at that time who are also now with me no longer young. But we were young then, high school, junior high age, when we were here. I was baptized up here. There used to be the tank. November 30, 1980. My wife Heidi and I were married right on this platform, May 21st, 1983. In May will be 40 years. So huge roots, and this place means a lot to me when we come here. But here's the part that happened that's somewhat incredulous. On Canada Day, 1982, this summer, 40 years ago, which is why I came to the building to be in the exact same spot, which is what Pastor Sean's referring to, which is how I sort of bumped into him. I grew up in Lake Country, and we had been water skiing all day because it was Canada Day, and there was a concert here on the stage with a group called Living Praise from Dallas, Texas, and they were here, and one of the people in the group was Greg Penoyer, whose family had deep roots in this church at that time. And I'd come for the concert, but we were late because we had been water skiing down at the south end of of Cal Lake. So we came up, and I didn't want to sit in here because I was late, So I went up in the balcony, and what to me would be to the right of your sound booth up here in the balcony, your left. I just, I got in, and the concert was up here. And I found in our old day picture albums, I found a photo that I took, because I was starting to get in photography at the time I was 19 years old. So I actually have a photo taken from there, looking here at this stage, 40 years ago. I'm minding my own business. The concert's amazing. It's all great. It was a Thursday night. And while I was up there, uh... I had a, a, a sacred, a close to an out-of-body experience. And it has been 40 years, and it is still tender for me to talk about today, and it all happened in this building. And the best way I can describe it, it sounds like I'm trying to be funny. I'm not trying to be funny, but it's the best way. I've, I've, try, I've had to describe this for so many years, because my life was overhauled on this day. My life was hijacked because I came to a concert here and was just sort of minding my own business late, suntan from the beach and the the water skiing. And then in the old Star Trek show, they used to move people around and they would stand and they would go in a beam like a particle mover. If those of you that are Trekkies know what this is called. I am not a Trekkie, but you know what I'm talking about. And then they were gone and then they were... It was like I was in that tube for about 30 minutes up there. It was almost like an out-of-body experience. And it overhauled my life. And without a doubt, without a doubt, as I stand here today, 40 years later, it was the fulcrum point of my life. 
my life before the concert up on the balcony and my life today, it's a fulcrum. And it changes. So you see, when you're young, you've seen a lot. So don't sometimes discredit the young people that are here. Don't discredit the teenagers you have, because even when you're young, you've seen things. David had seen Goliath. I'm telling you, this all happened to me by the time I was 19. When I got married on the stage, I was 20. Today, it sound like a kid. I thought I was extremely grown up and mature and had the world very understood at 20 when I married my 20-year-old bride right here on this stage. Think today that kids that are graduating from high school this year in the Vernon High Schools were born after 9-11. Right? It's like, what? How young are you? What? How is that even possible? But think of the things they've seen. They've seen the incro- increased role of women in our culture and in church. We've seen some progress in Canada with minorities and ethnicities and just being a little more sensitive to that. We have a long way to go, but it's, we've made some progress. The young people have seen that. But, but think of the negative things they've seen, too, just this summer where these guys go crazy in Saskatchewan and kill 10 people in, on their reserve in, in, in these rural towns. Like, what, right? That just happened. The residential schools have come up. Uh, the, we've all, including these young people, lived through this pandemic. So you see, even as a young person, you've seen plenty. But then, that's talking about what young people have seen and not seen. But now let's talk about being older. You look at the verse again. I mean, it's all right there. I've been young, and David says, now I'm old. And he's talking about, like, what what did David see in his lifetime? I'm not here to develop it all. My my goodness, he's amazing because he becomes a military genius. He's a king that's unparalleled. As a matter of fact, I I can almost guarantee everybody here in this room, either everyone in this room knows someone whose name is David. Because he's that famous and that respected to this day. And he's a gifted songwriter. There's 150 psalms in the Bible. He writes a whack of them, including the one we're reading here today, Psalm 37. So, but David also knew heartache. This is what I'm trying to show the balance here. He knew tremendous victories, read them in the Bible, but he knew heartache. And here's the one I want to focus on. This is also a bizarre story, but it's in the Bible, uh, uh, Samuel uh, 14 to 18. So just so that people know about it. 2 Samuel 14 through 18. David had a lot of wives and he had a lot of sons and, and, and people wanted to take over for him. And he had a son named Absalom. And Absalom wanted to use her. Absalom wanted the throne of David, but he wasn't in the proper order. So he, instead of waiting for the genetics to line up, sort of like what happened here with Prince Charles with Queen Elizabeth dying, and now we know that William is in line next, right? It's sort of like that through the genetics and, and the death. Absalom didn't want to wait for that, so Absalom tried to usurp the throne, and there became a civil war, and David had to fight his own son in, in battle. And he told, David told his military generals, when you see my son Absalom, whatever you do, do not kill him. It was, this is all in the Bible. Please not, if any of you know that, what I'm talking about. If, okay, the story's even going to get more bizarre, and it's even still in the Bible. Like I said, it's incredulous. So here, Absalom, no joke, his hair was so amazing that he only got his hair cut once a year and they weighed the, the hair they cut off. 200 shekels, it says in 2 Samuel 14. It means about five pounds. Roughly what a, a gallon of paint wear, weighs. Imagine your haircut is a national holiday and people go, shut up, that's some serious hair. Five pounds cut off? It's true. Now this, this battle goes on, and Absalom with his thick hair. During the battle, the, he's riding a donkey, and the donkey goes through a forest, and Absalom's hair gets caught in a tree branch. This is in the Bible. And the donkey keeps going, and Absalom is hanging from the branch with his hair caught, and the generals see it, the generals who've been told by David, don't kill him. And the general, one of the generals uh, comes up and puts three darts, boom, 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 right in his heart, kills him. And David pines for his son when David finds out, Absalom, Absalom, where is my son? You can read it in the Bible. He just loses it. You see, because when you're young and then also when you're old, you've seen some things. 
And you that are older in this room, you've seen some things. And not everything you see is positive. And because you're a person of faith or you're not a person of faith in this room, it's immaterial. You are still going to see some things that you didn't think you were going to see. I'll throw this in free of charge here. Isn't it interesting that it was Absalom's hair that got him killed? People say it's your weakness that'll snag you in life. No, they're wrong. You know your weakness, so you know you guard your weakness. It's your strength that'll trip you up because you get cocky and arrogant because you don't have to worry about it. Free of charges. Take that. That is. Okay, I am no longer young. Speaking of hair, half of my hair has divorced me. I didn't ask for that. Yes. I mean, they say you split it 50-50. I'm hoping to hold on to 50. My half. I'm losing. I go downstairs, my knees hurt. Who, who told me that was going to happen? If I stand and put my socks on, I consider that a victory. No one's, when we were young, told us this was going to happen when we got older. And for those of you that aren't unfamiliar with this story, this group that was on the stage here when I was 19, 1982, was from Dallas, Texas. And the next day, and I worked at High Steakhouse, and my friend Dennis is here from High's, my brother Kerry is here, my brother was my best man on the stage here. All these people were here at this time. I went the next day, High Steakhouse used to be at the Village Green, and I resigned and said, I, I, have, to, I have to go in the ministry, I have to do something, I was in this body, I would have body experience and everything, I just have to go. And Heidi and I went, we were 19 years old, and we came back here after one year of school in Texas, we got married on this stage, then we went back. And then the church that we attended, Trinity Church of Cedar Hill, Texas, they hired us. And at 22 years old, a kid from Oyama, this is no joke, a kid from Oyama, a kid who went to this church, who got zapped in the balcony. I became the youth pastor of 225 high school kids and I was 22 years old. I was like, I became a principal. We were part of a church that was uh, about 3,000 people. No joke. 70 staff, 10 pastors. And I'm like, what is happening? My wife and I, who have four children, three of our children, our children are all grown now, but three of our children were born in Dallas during this era. Almost every summer, we would come home, because our family is here, my mother-in-law is in the service here, Krista Kuhnert, she was part of this church then. And we would come to visit Krista and Heidi's family, and we would come here almost every summer. I don't remember a summer we missed that I ever came back, and I would attend here. And there were times way back that I would then speak here. So I spoke here a few times in these, in these first few years. It was fantastic. And then I, as Sean alluded to, we wanted to move home to Canada. There wasn't any, I got a job to be at the Victory Church in Lethbridge, which is where the Miracle Channel was, and some of you know this because you saw it. And I ended up, at age 34, pastoring one of the largest churches in Alberta. And I was on national television on the Miracle Channel, week in and week out. The kid from Oyama that got zapped here, that really happened to me. And that, in a quick nutshell, is 22 years old of, of 22, uh, from, that's 22 years of ministry, excuse me. And to the not young here, the people like Kirby, do you remember what it was like to be carefree like those days? We just assumed everything was going to work out. Do you remember what it was like to live pain-free? Your body didn't hurt or ache? There was a day when that existed. You, and the people that are here in this room that have that, they're like, what? Well, trust me. Your day's coming, because remember, you were young, and then you're not going to be young. There's some people in this room that are not young, like me, but you that are young, one day you will not be young. And you'll go, I remember that guy with the 50% hair loss. Tell me about this. Uh, and here's my, here's my lob to you for my tennis friends here. This is, this is me volleying it into your court. To my hockey friends here, this is me going over the red line and flipping the puck down into your end. You don't have to say it out loud, but you could debrief on your way home at dinner or in the car if you want with the people you came with. But think of this. You in the room here that are not young, if, and you think about a fulcrum point in your life, 
a day or in a season in your life where a lot of things changed for the good or the bad, but a definite fulcrum point day. Maybe you weren't 19, but maybe you were 9 or 29. But if you were that 9-year-old person, that 29-year-old person, and you were in the balcony like Kirby, and you then were on the stage at today's age, looking up. So for me, I'm looking up at Kirby 40 years ago. What would you say? What would you say to that person? What would I say to the, the, the kid that came out of the, the Star Trek tube and went, what just happened to me? I cried and cried and cried and could not stop crying. One thing all of us would say to our younger self is that disappointment, pain, and hardship are inescapable. You're going to go through some of that, including David, who lost Absalom. But let me wrap up with this part. Let's put the verse back up. So we talked briefly about being young. We talked briefly about being old. But then, and we talked about the things we've seen, things you've seen. But now let's talk about what David says here. Yet I have not seen. When you're older, you've seen a lot of things. My mother-in-law is here. She's 87. She was a child in World War II. They lived in refugee camps. And the German Baptist churches in Edmonton sponsored them to come to Canada as refugees in the 50s. My mother-in-law is 87 here today. She's seen a lot of things. Would you not agree? So have you. Think of what David has seen. I'm not talking some of the greatest military battles in the history in the Bible were conducted by him and his generals. Mind-blowing. Then he writes all these psalms. He's seen so much. And he says, you know, I have not seen one thing. I have never seen the righteous forsaken. I've never seen God's people abandoned, orphaned, left, hung out to dry. I've never seen God abandon his people. He goes, I've seen so much, but I've never seen that. And I thought, this is amazing that you and I, who've seen plenty like him, could say that, would say, hey, we've not seen this. Now, here's the only part about this verse that bugs me. He goes, I've never seen God's people forsaken. I've never seen that. And I would say to the 19-year-old Kirby in the balcony, and you would say to whatever age person that you're talking about in the balcony, your age, you would probably say the same thing. There's going to be things happen to you you don't understand. There's going to be things happen to you that are going to be exciting. There's going to be some things happen to you that are extremely painful. But regardless of what you go through, rest assured, you will never feel alone. You will realize when you look back, God was with you through the whole process. You can say amen. You can say, you, you'll go, you know, my life was, has been way more adventurous than I thought it would be from when I was 19. Traveled the world. I've been to Africa six times. I was on national television, pastored large churches, did all that. Heidi and I have had this crazy fun life. We have four granddaughters. We have four kids. It's like I'm sitting here today going, 40 years later, this is what happened? Wow. But I've never seen the righteous forsaken. He says, but here's the part I want to leave with you. He says in Psalm 22, why have you forsaken me? Jesus David wrote this, and I want everyone to get this with me, and then, I'll, like I said, I'm done. I guess I'm done. <laughs> it says here I have seven minutes left. Think of this verse. When Jesus hangs on the cross, suspended between heaven and earth, he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's a quote from Psalm 22. The quote is actually from David's psalm. David wrote it. It's called a messianic psalm because Jesus quotes it. But it's actually written by David when David was younger. David's young, he writes, my God, why have you abandoned me? Then when David's older, he writes, I've never seen God abandon anyone. I'm like, okay, David, you can't have it. It's, the irony is too rich here, right? The juxtaposition. In younger you, you say, God, you left me. And then older you, you say, you know, I've never seen God leave anyone. Well, right? It's a contradiction of the Bible. Now, you know what it is? It's human experience. When you're younger, you will go through times in your life where you will feel alone. You could have family around you, you could have spouses, and you will still feel alone. And when you feel orphaned and abandoned and forsaken, it's a low time in your life. But with the 
hindsight of being older, like David, writing Psalm 37 years after he wrote Psalm 22, and Kirby on the stage at 59, looking at his 19-year-old self, to say, you know, I actually never was alone. I have never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. Through it all, God was with me. God was there. His presence was there. The Holy Spirit was helping me. And I didn't even recognize it, acknowledge it, see it. But I'm older now, and I look back. And I would tell you that if I feel that way, then if you speak to yourself, the fulcrum point of your life, you, whatever age you are in the balcony, you would look back and say, you know what? Even through all this pain, I wasn't alone. And that's what David says in the Psalm. I was young, and now I'm old. I have never seen the righteous forsaken. I've never seen his seed begging bread. As you heard, I don't do this full time anymore. I invited a whack of you. Thanks for coming out because uh, I just, I met Pastor Sean because it was 40 years and I stood in this spot on the 40th anniversary this summer and Sean was here and I told him the story and he said, why don't you come tell it at church? So here I am today, a couple months later, speaking here. It's a real privilege to be here. So let's wrap up with prayer here. I did my best here, God, to tell the story. And I thank you that at 59 I can say, I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor have I ever seen a seed begging bread. Thank you for your faithfulness in our lives, God, even when we don't deserve it, when we don't understand it, when we don't recognize it, and when we are too young and too arrogant to even acknowledge it. I, we realize now that we're not young. You've been very good to us, even in spite of ourselves. God, what a privilege to be here back at Elam, which is now Alexis Park, to be on the same stage where I was baptized and married, spoke decades ago. It's a real honor. You've been very good to my family and me. I want to thank you publicly for that. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.